As California deals with a years long drought, Governor Newsom announced a new plan today to deal with the problem. He says that while comfort conservation is important, it's not the only thing to focus on. Among other things, he pointed to something we have right here in San Diego County as an example of what the state needs more of. Back in May, the operators of a desalination plant in Carlsbad showcased how it works and what it's done. We developed the project in Carlsbad and have been operating that facility since we came online in 2015. In that time, we have produced almost 90 billion gallons of fresh water for San Diego County residents. That plant is an example of what Governor Gavin Newsom says California should have more of. The hots are getting a lot hotter, the dries are getting a lot drier. Speaking in the Bay Area Thursday morning, Newsom outlined a new plan to address the drought. The latest map from the U.S. Drought Monitor shows a majority of California in either the severe, extreme, or exceptional categories. San Diego is one of the few spots in the moderate category. Science and the data leads us to now understand that we will lose 10 percent of our water supply by 2040. Newsom says that while conservation efforts are needed, the state must do more to increase its water supply and do it by building new reservoirs, desalination plants and water recycling facilities. The state would provide increased funding to local governments to fast track new water projects. And the reality is we need to be more creative and we need to be more aggressive. The plan would also allocate money towards increased conservation efforts. He also wants the legislature to make changes to the California Environmental Quality Act that could speed up approval for new projects. One of the principles of this plan is our efforts to change our permitting, and we're doing that. We're not talking about that. Now, Governor Newsom says much of the funding for the new water plant water plan would come from eight billion in budget surplus money. Let's go ahead and bring in ABC 10 News meteorologist Vanessa Paz, who's tracking our current drought conditions here in California. Hi, Vanessa. Right. Hi. Good evening, Lindsay. I want to first start off uh, and give you a live look right now from our Mount Woods and Sky Cam. Again, we are starting to see the increase of high level clouds right now and current conditions right now, 91 degrees. The relative humidity has backed off a little bit over the past couple of days, at least in comparison to what we noticed uh, earlier this week. Let's go ahead and switch gears and take a look at that drought monitor majority of the state still in that severe uh, and extreme level with the exception of uh, San Diego it looks like we're still at moderate. The good news is though we are expecting another round of rain that could potentially make its way to the coast. Again, we will take what we can get and it'll certainly uh, be beneficial as far as the terrain goes heading into uh, fire season. So let's go ahead and take a look at the rainfall since the water year. Uh, since October 1st, 2021, we've had about six inches. The normal though is close to 10 inches. So we're currently in about a three and a half deficit. Again, switching gears right now, we are looking at warm temperatures across the county, 90s for the Poway area. Meanwhile, in PB, a lot of people are headed to the coastal communities to beat the heat. Current temperatures right now, 78 degrees with light winds out of the northwest. So a little breezy there. Water temperature though, not too bad. We're trending in the 70s from Oceanside all the way down to the Imperial Beach area. Meanwhile, as temperatures on the land, lots of 70s, 80s and 90s across the board west of the mountains and still trending in the triple digits for the desert areas. We stayed pretty dry today and yesterday, but that's going to change looking ahead to tomorrow afternoon. We do have the return of monsoonal flow, which is going to increase that chance for thunderstorms towards the end of the week, and we'll give you a deeper dive into that a little later. Lindsay. All right, thanks, Vanessa. Turning now to the latest on monkeypox, the county reports 113 local cases. That case count nationwide has surpassed 10,000. Happening tonight, the county is having a virtual town hall on monkeypox to answer questions about the virus. A number of local doctors will be in that meeting to discuss it. It starts at 6 p.m. and we do have the Zoom link for the meeting posted on our website, 10news.com, under the Resource Center. The CDC has downgraded San Diego County's COVID community level from high to medium. It also loosened its COVID-19 guidelines today. It is dropping the recommendation that Americans should quarantine after being in close contact with an infected person. It also says that six feet of social distancing is no longer necessary. These changes come more than two and a half years since the pandemic began. The CDC says the reasoning behind the changes is that about 95% of all American adults have some level of immunity from getting vaccinated or being infected. Unemployment claims rose last week to the highest level since November, according to new data out today from the Labor Department. The four week average also went up, which typically levels out weekly ups and downs, but those numbers don't tell the whole story. 
Economists say the job market is still considered strong with a 50-year record low unemployment rate last month. Wholesale inflation is starting to slow down. That's the price that stores pay for products before we buy them. Now, it grew at a slower pace of 9.8% in July. You compare that to June, which was an 11.3% increase from last year. On a monthly basis, wholesale inflation did drop slightly from June to July, the first monthly decline since April of 2020. Now, grocery store prices are higher today than they were a year ago, meaning you have to get creative to make sure you can stretch what you have. I feel like I'm making a difference not only for my family, but for the people around me. This is one way people are getting creative with an app that is called Farmish. People with backyard gardens, small farms, they're on it selling everything from eggs to produce. This app connects people. Then you can talk prices off of the app. I raise chickens and I have these other things, the bees and everything, but I also I'm a herd share owner um, from a local dairy a few miles away, and I buy beef from a farm in Coopersville. I had an actual problem, which is that I, I couldn't yeah, spend all day sending text trying to get rid of a few cinnamon rolls, right? I might have like four extra cinnamon rolls, or I might have eight extra chocolate chip cookies. Now, if you're someone who loves to bake at home, the Baking Notification Project shares and sells food with people who live nearby. Now, if you don't bake, and maybe you also don't have a green thumb, you can check out what's called Olio, which is an app for people to share food and goods with others, extras that they may have. Too Good To Go is a service where you can buy excess food from restaurants and grocery stores at a major discount. And then there's one more for you called Food Rescue US, which lets you donate, deliver, and find others to share food with. Store-bought baby foods aren't the only way that babies could be exposed to toxic metals. There's new research from the group Healthy Babies Bright Futures, which tested homemade baby food made from produce purchased from stores and farmers markets across the country, and they found concerning levels of lead, arsenic, and mercury. Pediatricians say the best thing parents can do is spread out different foods in a baby's diet to lower toxicity levels. Now, parents and caregivers could have new protections when it comes to breast milk at the airport. Lawmakers want to require TSA to regularly update and clarify to workers guidance on handling breast milk and baby formula at the airport. A viral post from a mom showed TSA nearly confiscating her ice packs, which she needed to keep her breast milk from going bad on her flight. Climate change is increasing the cost of the federal crop insurance that farmers rely on, but all of us are paying for it. We are asking if an investment from taxpayers to have a more stable farm economy and more stable food system. The role that some say more farmers should be playing in keeping costs down. Also coming up, the struggles Ukrainian families sponsored in San Diego are facing as they work to rebuild their lives. We'll speak with one family about the help they need. Plus, the USS Abraham Lincoln returns home to San Diego. The special family reunions and first time meetings. We start this news feed with yet another addition to the list of what is costing us more these days. The U.S. Postal Service is raising its prices for the holiday season starting in October. Long distance deliveries could go up by as much as $6.50. Disney Plus is going to cost more too. It'll cost three more dollars a month at $10.99. There will also be a new option that will have ads that you can have for $7.99 a month. OnStar, it's the service where you can find a location, a stolen vehicle, or get in touch with first responders. And now GM is requiring new car buyers to get three years of that service for $1,500, whether they like it or not. GM sees OnStar as a big revenue driver. Gas prices continue to fall, but they are still high. The national average is still around 80 cents more a gallon compared to this time last year. The cost of car insurance also continues to increase, rising 1.3% in July after increasing nearly 2% in June. It's all making the cost of commuting more expensive. Now, Philadelphia will soon require companies with a certain number of workers to offer commuter benefits. Large employers in some cities offer these kind of benefits as well, but HR experts don't necessarily see more companies going this direction long term. 
there's a lot of chatter in the system amongst major employers who are saying, listen, this is just one more factor, one more thing we will take into consideration when deciding whether or not to move to a city or to remain in that city. So the idea that one day the city is directing people to pay for driving, uh, where does it stop? Now, he says companies are more sensitive to people working minimum wage jobs, also to people asking for help specifically around gas rather than those asking for a general pay increase. That's a discussion we're having more and more that says you have to be careful about the argument that things are going up, so raise my salary. Because when things come down, we want to have a conversation potentially about reducing your salary. Good point. Some companies also pointing out that the savings that you may have if you're working a hybrid work schedule compared to when you were commuting every day, when you can prove your costs have increased, some employers are offering perks like an additional day working from home or lunch more often that's on the company. Meanwhile, the Arctic region is feeling the heat from climate change. A new study says the Arctic has been warming more rapidly than the rest of the world for the past few decades. The study was published in the journal Nature Communications, Earth and Environment. Researchers say heat trapping emissions from the burning of fossil fuels is causing temperatures to increase in the North Pole region four times as much as everywhere else. The phenomenon is called Arctic amplification. This 10 News Pinpoint Weather Report is sponsored by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air. Nobody wows clients like we do. Warming seems to be the theme just the in, in general right, right. now, yeah, yeah. especially here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had another warm and muggy day, but the good news is looking at some of the relative humidity numbers, we're actually a little lower in comparison to the start of the week. So we have a little bit of relief as far as the mugginess goes, but tomorrow it picks back up again once we have another surge of monsoonal moisture, which I'll explain in just a moment. Let's go ahead and start things off this Thursday evening from some of our sky cams ranging from the downtown area to Ramona. We do have a mix of sun and high level clouds outside. Current temperatures are warm. We're trending in the low 80s in spots like downtown, close to 90 degrees for some of those inland areas, including Poway, Mission Valley, close to uh, 90 as well. Low 90s in Ramona and mid to upper 70s in the South Bay. As I mentioned, relative humidity uh, numbers aren't as high as they've been in comparison to Monday and Tuesday. It looks like they've backed off a little bit. Of course, they're still high along the coastline because of that onshore flow. That is usual. This evening, as far as temperatures go, not a ton of relief. We'll still trend warm and muggy will be in the low 70s along the coastal communities. Very comparable temperatures for the inland valleys as well. Low 70s for those overnight hours in rain cloud future cast. We have that marine layer that will build back in along the coastline this evening, giving us a partly cloudy start to your Friday morning. But it's really that surge of monsoonal flow that makes a return tomorrow afternoon, impacting the mountains and desert area. So you could see that we could have a couple of cells bringing in thunderstorm activity as early as 1 30 p.m. afternoon confined to the the mountains and deserts, but I'm not ruling out the chance for some of that it's instability to move a little westward, which could bring a shower or two for the inland valleys, including Escondido and Empawe. As we take a look at the weather headlines, as we finish off the last few days of your work week, monsoon storms, as I mentioned, possible in the mountains and deserts tomorrow with some of that instability possibly making its way for the inland valleys, which could give us a shower or two. Slight cooling over the next few days will drop a few degrees by the weekend, and then we'll have increasing shower activity looking ahead to next Wednesday, and that's when we could see a greater chance for monsoon storm activity. As of right now, there are no watches and warnings for the mountains and deserts in relation to the thunderstorm activity we're experiencing expecting, but that could change in the next 24 hours. So low 80s as we wrap up the end of your week into the weekend, upper 70s by Sunday. Inland areas will trend in the low 90s for the next several days. And as I mentioned, we have a little bit of cooling starting next week. We'll be back in the upper 80s. Mountain areas in the mid to upper 80s by Sunday, mid 80s. So again, we do drop a few degrees looking ahead to the latter part of your weekend. We'll be near that 110 range by tomorrow, and then we'll turn a few degrees cooler this weekend in the deserts. All Thank right, you. thanks, Vanessa. And still to come, Congress is expected to pass the first major climate package in the U.S. tomorrow. Local Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs weighs in on how that could shape the future. Skycam Views, sponsored by Carlsbad Solar. Having federal crop insurance can make or break a farm in emergency situations. And the federal crop insurance program is paid for in part by farmers, but also by taxpayers, just like you and me. Chloe Nordquist took a look at how those payouts are now increasing and what that is costing all of us. Hey guys, 
Day to day, running a farm takes a lot of work. They like their oats. You can see the soybean pods starting to form. And farms are facing more and more unknowns due to a changing climate. Two years ago, we had a derecho here. This field was corn that year, and the corn got flattened. Lee Tesdell showed us around his farm, which has been in the family for more than 100 years, where he's now focused on more resilient farming. This is one of the ways that we're trying to make the land more resilient. April 22nd, 2022. Just this April, a three inch rainstorm caused flooding, taking fertilizer and topsoil with it. We expect to see more of those uh, severe weather events. This is where federal crop insurance comes in. This crop insurance program, it pays farmers when they have a crop yield or revenue loss. The Environmental Working Group, a nonprofit research organization, is doing ongoing research on how much climate is impacting these payouts. From 1995 to 2020, farmers received more than $143 billion in federal crop insurance. The biggest causes of loss over that big time frame, 1995 to 2020, First was drought. That was far and above the, the largest cause of loss. And then the second was excessive moisture. So the other side of drought. The federal crop insurance program has saved, financially saved some farmers some years. But it's not just farmers footing the bill. 60% of these crop insurance premiums are subsidized by taxpayers. So we all pay this bill. We are asking an investment from taxpayers to have a more stable farm economy and more stable food system. In places like Iowa, for example, where cornfields stretch as far as the horizon, crop insurance can be an important tool. But Aaron Lehman with the Iowa Farmers Union says farmers should also do their part. I think it's that's why it's important for farmers to be involved in doing things that can mitigate climate change. It makes sense that we should do more to tie good practices to crop insurance. This federal crop insurance program really discourages farmers from adapting to climate change. Every five years, the federal farm bill is discussed and changes are made. For the 2023 farm bill, discussions have already begun in Washington. Our farm bill kind of sets the direction for our farm policy for the next five years, so it's important that the discussions include crop insurance and how we can have the most effective crop insurance. In Des Moines, Iowa, I'm Chloe Nordquist reporting. Chloe, thank you. And inflation is forcing more companies to tack on fees right before you check out the ways that you can fight this and avoid paying extra. Also coming up, Ukrainian families sponsored in San Diego are trying to start over the roadblocks they're facing and the help they're asking for. You're watching ABC 10 News at 4. It's always stressful. I don't have money to pay for something. Back in April, President Biden announced the Uniting for Ukraine campaign. It allows American families to apply to be a sponsor for Ukrainian families, providing them temporary housing while they get on their feet. But the problem is that Ukrainian families are meeting roadblocks in trying to start their own lives. ABC 10 News reporter Sofia Hernandez sat down with one family who says now they're just asking for help. The Sipchekno family came to the U.S. in June. Through a local organization called Slavic Services, they were able to be paired with a sponsor family for two weeks. It was a very big help for all family. Vitalina says her family of four then went to a second home for three weeks and are now in this home for a month. But it's not picture perfect. I look at the calendar and look at this day when people, uh, person who give opportunity to leave me just temporarily, tell tell me you have to go in this day. It's always frustrating for me. It's always stressful for me. Vitalina is trying to provide for her twin and 60 year old parents, but she can't get a work permit and neither can they, which means they can't pay for rent, groceries or transportation. Ask God help me, please give me more patient to to go in this way, which you give opportunity to me to to come here. I mean, it's still difficult. And they are not the only family in this predicament. Christina with Slavic Services says a work permit could take up to eight months to get. That's not including the time it takes to get approved for a temporary social security or other legal documentation. So they're supposed to support themselves somehow, but they cannot work 
So it's like unbelievable. And also, like most of the host family, they won't host them for this so long term. You know, it's also responsibility. Which means that Vitalina is already trying to think of where they will pack their bags to next. I, I had a very great my life there in Ukraine, and but I am not coming here and tell, oh, I was on a business there, or I want to be on a business now. I am ready for any job here. I just want to have opportunity to pay my rent, to pay everything here by myself. Scouring to find any job she can do just to find a place of their own. Big help for me to have opportunity to pay for everything and to make my next step in this country. Sofia Hernandez, ABC 10 News. If you would like to learn how you can apply to be a sponsor or help families like Vitalina's, you can visit our website, 10news.com. And here's the latest on the war in Ukraine, which is nearing its six month mark. Denmark and the United Kingdom committed to send more aid to Ukraine for weapons, equipment and training. This comes as new satellite images show the damage to a Russia air base in Crimea, which destroyed several aircrafts. It was hit by explosions earlier this week, which is raising doubts that Russia can protect territory it has control of in southern Ukraine. That is new video showing the moment a house exploded in Indiana, killing three people. This was from a neighbor's doorbell camera. The blast happened yesterday and investigators are looking into what caused it. It also caused widespread damage to other homes. The American Red Cross is stepping in to help the families left homeless. Tomorrow, the House is expected to pass the Inflation Reduction Act in another bid to ease rising costs for Americans. It already passed the Senate last weekend. The multi-billion dollar package calls for lower health care and prescription costs and combating climate change. We spoke with local Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs today about what could be the largest investment in climate change the federal government has ever made. We will get to reducing our carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. That is huge. That gets us back on the path of the Paris Climate Accords and will be really important in making sure that there's a world that's livable for you know my future children. We also reached out to Congressman Daryl Issa for comment on the bill and are waiting to hear back. We'll be tracking tomorrow's vote and let you know what happens. It's a welcome sign for drivers coast to coast. For the first time since March, the price of gas nationally is averaging under $4. American drivers, they can look at this as, as a, a bit of a threshold. We are now below that $4 barrier where a lot of people have decided they're going to change their driving habits. They're going to change their lifestyle. Meanwhile, consumers aren't getting breaks yet on food and electricity prices. Both rose again in July. But as for those gas prices, the White House says those should continue to come down a little more. And here's where our local gas prices stand. The average price for regular dropped another one and a half cents to 5.37 a gallon, according to AAA. That's a dollar less than what we were paying in mid-June, but it is still just over a dollar more than the price a year ago. This marks the 57th straight day of price drops in our county. Hugs and kisses all around at NAS North Island at the, as the USS Abraham Lincoln pulled into port this morning. ABC 10 News photojournalist Lyle McCarty and reporter Marie Cornell were dockside for the homecoming and bring us those uplifting moments. After seven months, the USS Abraham Lincoln has returned to its home port of NAS North Island after a routine deployment. No matter where you're born, speechless. This is the first time Brian Farber met his newborn daughter, a milestone mom Rebecca has been thinking about for months. The dread of him leaving before and now just waiting and waiting and thinking about it has been, I mean, it's almost unbearable, but then, you know, we have this baby to keep me going. Brian is one of the sailors serving on board the USS Abraham Lincoln. The Lincoln is the centerpiece for the strike group, which is made up of six ships and 75,000 sailors and Marines. This deployment took the USS Abraham Lincoln through ports of the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East. This was a milestone deployment for the ship's CEO, Amy Bernschmidt, who was the first woman to command a U.S. aircraft carrier. She says the combination of her training and staff made this first mission successful. There is, there is a lot of schooling that gets you most of the way there, but nothing is quite the same as being here and doing it. Now that the USS Abraham Lincoln is back, she'll go through routine maintenance while the crew prepares for the next mission. 
Reporting from NAS North Island, Marie Cornell, ABC 10 News. Russia is confirming for the first time today that negotiations are underway for a prisoner exchange. This comes after the U.S. proposed a deal to release WNBA star Brittany Griner and former Marine Paul Whelan. The U.S. offered to trade a Russian arms dealer currently serving a 25-year sentence in Illinois. In the meantime, Griner's lawyers are planning to appeal her nine-year prison sentence in Russia. The FDA has found a way to stretch the country's monkeypox vaccine supply from 440,000 to more than 2 million. But the question obviously is, does it now provide the same amount of protection? This week, the agency approved giving the vaccine between layers of skin rather than under the skin like other shots. And this makes the vaccine more potent, requiring just a fifth of the normal dose. Now, it is similar to how a tuberculosis test is given and leaves behind the same side effects, which is redness, swelling, and itching around the injection site. Data shows administering vaccines this way can actually be more effective, but there will be a learning curve. The folks who are giving it are going to have to use different needles, draw up different amounts. So there's going to be an element of training that's going to have to go along with this. Vaccines will still be allowed under the skin for people under 18 who are at high risk for monkeypox. An interesting metaphor from Moderna CEO. He says that COVID vaccines will evolve like the iPhone. He says that Moderna is hoping to create a one dose annual shot for COVID. You think like the flu and other respiratory issues. He hopes that it will be ready within the next five years. Now getting a wheelchair fixed can be time consuming and complicated. All of these companies, they want to sell, they don't want to repair, and we need the government to make policy so that it is more attractive to repair than to sell. The action one state has taken to fix this and the push to get others to follow. Getting a wheelchair fixed can often take weeks or months, and disability advocates say that's because the companies that make wheelchairs don't share repair manuals and parts, and that makes it very difficult for third-party repair companies to do the work. Jesse Cohen found there is a solution that disability advocates say would help, but only one state has done it so far. For more than 30 years, Bruce Gogan has been wheelchair bound. And that chair has become a more prominent lifeline over the years as multiple sclerosis has continued to take away his mobility. Well, the only thing you can move is your head like that. Every little thing is a, a big loss. Disability advocacy has always been a big part of his life. Getting arrested at a protest is where he met his wife, Robin Bulldock. And along the way, we've always been involved with public policy. It's kind of corridor marriage, I guess. Yes. So as life has shown them how difficult it is to get Bruce's wheelchair repaired, they knew they needed to push for more permanent change. Historically, manufacturers of these chairs do not provide customers or independent repair shops with the parts, tools, software, or paperwork needed to perform any repair services. The only way to get a problem fixed is to go through them, and it can take weeks or months. When Bruce doesn't have a wheelchair, he's in bed, uh, and there's really nothing he can do there, and it risks, because um, he's not moving, it risks pneumonia and it risks, of course, um, bed sores. This couple is a huge reason why Colorado has become the first state in the country to have a right to repair law, but their powerful story certainly came at a cost. And the frustrating part is the first time we had a major breakdown, they decided it was a motor, but they couldn't find a motor. This is like a national company, probably international company, couldn't find a motor for chair. their brand new chair. The companies that predominantly control the multi-billion dollar power wheelchair industry are owned by private equity firms. Those wheelchair suppliers have contracts with health insurance plans and restrict access to repair materials. Disability advocates say companies often wait until Medicare or insurance companies approve repair claims before ordering necessary parts, which aren't always kept on hand. This law requires them 
to provide customers with the tools and information necessary to fix their chairs. All of these companies, they want to sell, they don't want to repair, and we need the government to make policy so that it is more attractive to repair than to sell. Julie Riskin is the co-executive director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. She's proud of the progress Colorado has made, but says it won't mean much if other states don't follow suit. We're hoping that our attorney general will step up. He has a good record on consumer protection, and we're hoping that he'll see our community is worthy of that protection. She says they need to be held accountable for both providing the specs and information needed to repair a chair, but also by manufacturing the necessary parts. What a lot of these companies do also is they'll sell it, they'll sell a chair and then they'll ch and then they just start changing stuff every year and then they'll say, "Oh, now you need a new chair because we're not servicing the parts anymore," even though the chair is totally functional. When something needs to be fixed, there are few temporary options available for people who use a wheelchair. And for a lot of us who use what we call complex rehab, our chairs are made to our body specifications. So it's not like you can go rent a chair. Power wheelchair users have Good. long been fighting for their right to repair, something that has infringed on their mobility for decades, and they say still does in 49 states. Reminds me of something that Her Herbert Humphrey said. The test of a country is how it treats its most vulnerable citizen. Bruce and Robin say now is the time to change how those citizens are treated in this country and put lives before profit. In Broomfield, Colorado, I'm Jesse Cohen reporting. This 10 News Pinpoint Weather Report is sponsored by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air. Nobody wows clients like we do. Vanessa mentioned that the humidity may have gone down just a little bit, and I, I think I bit. felt it. I yeah. thought it was my imagination. It's it? not your imagination. The numbers <laughs> don't lie, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, I, again, we're still warm and muggy outside, but the relative humidity, it's a little less as far as percentage-wise, and we'll show you those numbers in just a moment. I will tell you where everyone is beating the heat, though, and that's along the beaches. Here's a live look at the packed PB Sky Camp right now. A lot of people paddling out and also just swimming. Right now, current temperature is 77 degrees. And it's pretty breezy. We have that onshore flow winds out of the northwest of about close to 15 miles per hour. In case you're wondering how warm is that water? How brave are those people in the water? Well, not too brave. In fact, it's actually kind of warm spanning from Oceanside down to IB. We're trending in the mid to low 70s as far as uh, water temperatures go. And we're looking at a west swell bringing in sets anywhere from three to four feet. Again, spanning from Oceanside. All